Okay guys, here we go with another uh, hypothesis test. So as I read through this, be on the listen for what is the variable in this problem? Or how can we infer, are we in mean land or proportion land? So an article reported that female crickets are attracted to males that have high chirp rates and hypothesized that chirp rate is related to nutritional status. The usual chirp rate for male field crickets was reported to vary around a mean of 60 chirps per second. To investigate whether chirp rate was related to nutritional status, investigators fed male crickets on a high protein diet for eight days, after which chirp rate was measured. The mean chirp rate for the crickets on the high protein diet was reported to be 109 chirps per second. Is this convincing evidence that the mean chirp rate for crickets on a high protein diet is greater than 60, which would imply an advantage in attracting the ladies? Suppose that the sample size and the sample standard deviation are 32 and 40. We test the relevant hypotheses at a 1% alpha. Okay, whew, that's a lot. Again, it's like a paragraph. It's not even like a paragraph. It is a paragraph. So the first thing that stood out to me was the word mean. All right, it was a pretty clear indication that I was gonna be in mean land. I also saw this number of 60 chirps per second. And as soon as I saw units, Right? I wasn't dealing with proportions or ratios. I knew I was also, again, in mean land. I, I saw another average get tossed out there. I saw 109 chirps per second. And maybe you saw that uh, there was another mean, right? Here's another average. So I'm seeing two averages in there. Okay. Okay. Um, I saw the word evidence, right? I'll just kind of underline that. As soon as I saw evidence, I knew I was going to run a hypothesis test. I saw, again, mean chirp rate. That was another thing that turned, uh, that kind of stuck out to me. I saw greater than 60, right? Uh, and then, of course, they gave me sample size, sample standard deviation. So the 32 and the 40, those were good. I'll use the 1% alpha. So those, to me, are the important things that I saw floating around here. So I have... 32 crickets, right? They said my sample size is 32 and the numerical variable amongst all of those is their chirp rate, right? Are these these crickets that have been hopped up on protein, are they chirping like crazy and attracting lady crickets? Well, let's find out. So I'm definitely in mean land. All right, it means I'm gonna use a t-test statistic I also only have the one sample again. I, I get that I have 32 crickets in that sample, but I only ran this experiment once. So we're gonna do one sample. Okay. Now, as we start to go through this, maybe you heard there were two averages, right? I heard an average of 60 and an average of 109. And when you're in these hypothesis test problems, whether you're in mean land or proportion land, you are given two of those things. And I know that's real technical to say two of those things. But what I mean is you're either given two means or two proportions. Now we're in mean land, we were given two means. One of these averages is the parameter. One of these averages is the, is the statistic. And you have to discern which is which. All right, you wanna use the parameter and your null and your alternate. And you wanna save the statistic until you get to step 10. So let's try and figure this out. We're gonna go through our steps on our hypothesis test. All right, I'm gonna use technology to help me, but let's get, get our setup going. All right, so step one is to define a parameter. So I'm gonna define a mu, okay? So we got true average something, let's see. Mu is gonna equal the true average chirp rate and who are we talking about? We're talking about crickets on a high protein diet. True average chirp rate for crickets on a high protein diet. Right, and the units are, I'll scrunch them in here, chirps per second. Okay. All right. Steps two and three, you can reference back to them, but I'm going to tell you they're always ho and ha. Okay. Whatever parameter you defined in step one should show up in step two. So we got mu with an equal sign here, and I'm going to have a mu here. All right. I got to decide. 
Which of these is the parameter? Which one is the statistic? When we figure out which one's the parameter, I'm gonna put the parameter in the null. I'm gonna save the statistic till the end. I always find it's easier to identify the sample, right? To identify the statistic. And I, I can see it here, right? The mean chirp rate for the crickets on the high protein diet was reported to be 109. So out of these 32 crickets, they had a chirp rate of 109, right? This number was coming from my sample, meaning that's my statistic. All right, and then we're just comparing it to the status quo, right? The status quo for regular old crickets was 60 chirps per second. So here is my parameter. This one here is my statistic. So that means I'm gonna put 60 in my mean. I'm gonna save this 109, that's not gonna show up until step 10. All right, and then I see the diet is greater than 60, so we're gonna go mu is greater than 60 here. All right, and the units again, chirps per second. All right, maybe we're starting to memorize these, maybe we're not, but step four is your alpha level. I'm not gonna to default to 5% because I was given a 1% alpha. It looks like we lowered the threshold of making a type one error. It means we're more likely to make a type two error, but that's okay. All right, so step five is our assumptions. All right, so if I head back to that trait table, all right, that organizer that I'm using, my first assumption is, did I have a random sample or did my sample represent my population? So let's see what we got going on here. So if I kind of buzz through with this entire problem, there is nothing about these crickets being selected at random. And I don't know if you've ever been around crickets. My roommate used to have a frog, so we used to go buy crickets to feed the frog. Crickets are jumpy little critters, and it is so hard to get a random sample of them. Like, they're just flicking everywhere. It would be really difficult to assign each of them a number and then be like, okay, let me get my TI-84 calculator out and get a random sample. So it's okay that they're not random. Again, it's not a deal breaker, but I, I wouldn't even know how to bias my sample so that I had crickets uh, that I, I, I selected crickets that would throw my results off. I mean, I'm just gonna pick a bunch of crickets, shove them full of protein and see how fast they're chirping. All right, step two is the deal breaker. It's normality. So let's see if we can move on with this problem, if we've accomplished normality. Now there are three ways to get it. Let's see, was my population distribution stated to be normal? Well, if we go back through this giant paragraph, nowhere in there was the word normal, okay? But if it wasn't stated, use the CLT as long as the sample size is 30 or higher. My sample size is 32, so the central limit theorem has kicked in. Great, I'm just gonna take note of that. Okay. Now, step three, or I should say assumption three, is to identify your sample standard deviation. Well, I know my S, it was given to me. They told me my sample standard deviation was 40, so let me go ahead and write that in. S equals 40. And again, the units on this would have been chirps per second. Okay, great. I'm through my assumptions. Okay, so let's go back to our 13 steps. All right, again, maybe you have these memorized, maybe you don't, but maybe you're starting to memorize them. If you do enough of these, oh, you just, they become embedded in your head. All right, here we go. State the distribution. Well, we're in mean land. We're gonna be on the T distribution. What's the name of the test? Well, I had one sample. I was in mean land and I'm doing a T hypothesis test. For degrees of freedom, that's sample size minus one. I had 32 crickets, so I have 31 degrees of freedom. All right, and then I can display the test statistic without any computation. So I'm gonna do steps six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay, and then we'll, we'll flip back to this paper. All right, so step six, again, state the distribution. I am on the T distribution. All right, step seven, state the name of the test. I have a one sample mean T hypothesis test. All right, step eight, the degrees of freedom are, well, I had, again, 32 crickets, so I have 31 degrees of freedom. There will be some folks that actually put a subscript of 31 here, 
just to say that you're on the T distribution associated with 31 degrees of freedom. And then there are some other folks that'll just straight up say, well, this is 30 or higher, so I'm gonna go on the Z distribution. I I'm not gonna do that. I want a little bit more wiggle room, so I'll stay on the T distribution. All right, so let me scooch this up so we can get to step nine. Okay, so let's try and do step nine here. So step nine is my test statistic. So T will equal X bar minus mu in ratio to the standard error of S over square root N. Okay, great. Let's see, what was my sample mean? Well, I fed these crickets some protein and they were chirping up at 109 chirps per second. I hypothesized that it would be 60. My sample standard deviation is 40. And my sample size is 32. All right, and this is the beginnings of step 10. Okay, now it's at this point, I would go use technology to help me with the rest of my write-up. Okay, so I'm gonna hit the pause button right now. We're gonna flip over to your calculator. I'm gonna show you how you get all those numbers on your calculator. And then I'm gonna come back here and have my output screen inform my write-up from here on in. So I'll catch you in a bit, bye. Hey Math 43, let's look at one more hypothesis test together. Um, this one will be slightly different from example nine in that we don't have the raw data. Uh, we have summary statistics to help us get through this. So let's take a look at how our calculator screen can help us get steps 10, 11, and 12. And then again, I've said this a few times, but it's, it's great to repeat. Uh, I always use technology to find steps 10, 11, and 12 first, and then I will use my calculator output screen to help me write up all 13 steps. So as we go through this, we know we're in mean land. We know we're running a hypothesis test. So let's hit stat, go over to tests, and we're going to be option two. And it saves everything that we just did from example nine. So let's swap this out now for example 10. We don't have the raw data, right? I don't have all 32 chirp rates for those crickets. I just have the summary statistics. So I'm going to make stats go live. Um, and then our null hypothesis, um, again, for crickets that weren't on a high protein diet, their chirp rate was 60 chirps per second. All right, so that's the hypothesized mean. Our sample mean, we found out when we put them on a high protein diet, their chirp rate was actually 109 chirps per second. So they are chirping like crazy, right? Practically double, give them a little protein. Um, we were told that our sample standard deviation was 40 chirps per second. How many crickets did we have? Let's see, oh, we had 32 crickets. So that was my sample size. And then here, again, I need to decide, do I have a two-tailed test, a left-tailed test, or a right-tailed test? And our alternate was the greater than version. So I do have a right-tailed test, and it looks like it's already highlighted. You can choose calculate or draw. I'm going to go to calculate. And let's see, I have a pretty large test statistic, right? Seven, I mean, it's, it's pretty hard to be seven standard deviations over the mean. And it's not exactly a z-score, which is the number of standard deviations, any data value is above or below the mean. Um, but the, the, the T distribution, it's pretty close. It's, it's similar enough to number of standard deviations above the mean, and it's hard to be seven over. You can see your p-value there, all right, 4.45 or 49, actually, if I say it, it should just be 4.5. But again, no p-value can actually be 4.5. It has to be a number between zero and one. So we're looking at uh, zero, basically, because of that e to the negative eight. And then you can see all those numbers that we input there. So that's great. That can get us step 10 and step 11. And then let's try to draw it, see what we get. All right, so if I go down here and I get click on draw, and you can imagine with a p-value of zero, I'm not gonna shade anything, because the number of your p-value should match the proportion of the area under the curve that you're shading. If my p-value is zero, right, zero, I should shade zero area under that curve. Because if we remember all the way back to chapters five and six, probability in continuous numerical land is area under a curve. All right, so with that, you can see that just based off of your calculator screen, you can get steps 10, 11, and 12, plus it'll help you for all of the rest of your write-up. All right, guys, that will do it for example 10. Bye. Okay, we're back. So let me just review up how I would be doing this, right? I turn my calculator on. Let's clear that out. We'll go to stat, tests. 
I'm doing the T test, right? I'm not gonna do Z's in here. I'm in a one sample mean T test. Now I had summary statistics. Uh, let's go here, my null was 60. My sample mean was 109. My sample standard deviation was 40. My sample size, I had 32 crickets. I had a greater than alternate. And I'm gonna go down here and hit calculate and that's gonna inform me. There's my test statistic. It looks like it's 6.93. So let me go ahead and put that this number was 6.93. All right, now this will also help me, that output screen will help me with step 11. I know my p-value has to be a probability. So I'm gonna need p with some stuff in parentheses and, and I'll fill that in in a moment, but here's my p-value, right? I can see it. And again, please don't tell me your p-value is 4.49. P-values are probabilities. So they have to be numbers between zero and one. So don't forget the e to the negative eight over here. So let's just keep in mind our p-value is zero. For all intents and purposes, our p-value is zero. All right, but in terms of how you get the p-value, and you could read it from your output screen, but I wanna do it the longer way because there's times when you'll have to use TCDF to get these p-values. You won't have enough information to use the t-test function in your calculator. So what goes in these parentheses? You always put a letter, then you put a symbol, then you put a number. All right, so the letter that you're gonna use is the letter in step six, so I'm gonna do T, okay? The symbol you're going to use corresponds to your alternate, so I'm gonna go greater than. The number you're going to use corresponds to step 10, okay? So it's always letter, symbol, number. Now here I would go TCDF, right? I'm gonna go low, high, and my degrees of freedom was 31, okay? Now, I happen to know this number. Again, it's zero. I knew that going in because of my calculator output screen. So that, that calculator output screen can tell me my p-value right out the gate. I know it's zero, but I really do think, not I think, it, you're going to need to know how to do this using TCDF because I will give you problems where you can't hit stat test two, you're gonna have to go TCDF. If we did TCDF here, you could see if I did 6.93 to infinity with 31 degrees of freedom, you can see that p-value is basically zero, right? 4.49, there's a slight discrepancy, right? This was 497, this is 493, but it's, it's really, really close. All right, times 10 to the negative eight. So I got that. If I wanna get my drawing going on for step 12, head down here, hit draw, and then it'll take a little while, but there comes my, my test, I mean, my, my distribution, right? Zero's under the peak, standard deviation of one, two, three, for the most part. All right, so let me go ahead and draw this in. I'll put it here, so step 12, let me, raise this up so we can see everything. All right. Okay, so as we do this, right, I know zero is under the peak. I'm gonna label my x-axis with a T. Now 6.93 is way the heck down here. Okay, I don't know, it's something like this, 6.93. You can see that there's basically no area under that curve for me to shade, which is fine, all right? That should match, if your p-value is zero, the area you shade under that curve should be zero as well. All right, last, last step that we gotta do, we gotta state our conclusion, so you gotta actually commit Right? What did I do to the null? Did I reject it or fail to reject it? And then do I have evidence for the alternate or not? Well, let's find out. So here's the cutoff, okay? So we gotta compare our p-value to our alpha level. So steps 11 to step four. So let's see what we had this time out. All right, so my step 11, my p-value, we just said it was zero, and my alpha was 1%. So p-value is less than alpha. 
When it's less than alpha, I'm gonna reject H naught. So that's the first thing I'm gonna say. Because my p-value is less than alpha, we reject H naught. And whenever you reject H naught, it means, hey, I think the alternate is true, right? Or we will say we have sufficient evidence for the alternate. All right, so as we start to do this, let's say for step 13, right, because our p-value is less than alpha, we reject H naught. Okay, so we got that going on. Because our p-value is less than alpha, we reject H naught. All right, so I'm gonna say we have evidence, or we have sufficient evidence for HA. And again, I don't want you to leave this as HA. Tell me what HA represents. So let's, let's go find out what did HA, what was our alternate in this case? Well, it looks like our alternate was mu is greater than 60. Okay, well, what does that mean? It means that the true average chirp rate for crickets on a high protein diet is greater than 60 chirps per second. That's what we have evidence for. So let's go back to our alternate now. All right, and let's, let's write that up. Okay, so let me get this kind of squared away. So instead of we have evidence, or sufficient evidence for the alternate, we're gonna say we have sufficient evidence that the true average chirp rate for crickets on a high protein diet is greater than 60 chirps per second. Okay, all right, fantastic, that's it. We think if we pump them full of protein, they're gonna chirp faster. That's what our data is showing us, right? Our sample data was at, it was an average of 109 chirps per second. That is way faster than 60 chirps per second. All right. Now let's answer these last two questions here, these last two free response questions. So we've got what type of error might have been made and are these results statistically significant? So in terms of the type of error, you gotta choose between type one and type two. You only got two errors you can make. So let's see what we think here. A type one error is when you reject the null even though it was true. A type two error is when you fail to reject the null and it was false. So let's see what we did. All right, you can see here we rejected the null, all right? So because our p-value was less than alpha, actually, is that in view for you guys? Let me see. I think I gotta just scooch this down a bit. Oh, there we go. All right, so because our p-value was less than alpha, we opted to reject the null. And whenever you reject the null, you run the risk of making a type one error. Because if you reject it and it was true, that was an error. So we potentially made a type one error. All right, I won't actually know if I made the type one error unless I were to run the census. Okay, are these test results statistically significant? All right, now to be statistically significant, we would say um, results are statistically significant if the null is rejected. All right, i.e. there's a low probability that this difference in chirp rate could have occurred just by chance. All right, so we're saying, what's the likelihood that this difference of chirp rate, this going from 60 to 109 happened just from chance, just from sampling variability? Well, it's not very likely, meaning that these results are statistically significant. We've rejected the null, and it's time to change our mind about giving crickets protein. We know that we can take that action, right? We, if we give them some protein, it's gonna influence their chirp rate. But the answer to this, this question, are these test results statistically significant? The answer is yes, all right? We have changed our mind. We have evidence that if I pump you full of protein, your chirp rate's gonna go up, right? That's a new addition, all right? New findings in this experiment, all right? And this is the evidence to back that statement. All right. So with that, we're going to work on some multiple choice questions. I'll see you in a few. Bye.